Hi, this is Mallory Nye, and welcome to episode two of the Histories Inc. podcast series. In this episode, I'm going to give a brief overview of issues of the history of empire and encounter that frame and cluster topics within this Histories Inc. podcast series. If you've just tuned in, I'd recommend you listen to episode one first, where I give a broader introduction to the podcast themes and what I'm intending to do with this podcast series. You'll find that either on my website on mallorynigh.com forward slash histories inc or otherwise under that name histories inc on either iTunes or Stitcher. So, as I said at the end of the first podcast, the next few episodes are going to be exploring the themes, the clusters of ideas uh, that are going to frame my discussion in this Histories Inc. podcast to look through issues, first of all, of empire and encounter, then of various aspects of religion, particularly the Protestant Reformation and Islam and Europe, then looking at the indelible stain of slavery and then Scotland, Scottish history, the broad issues in the history of the nation of Scotland, and in particular historical issues related to the city of Perth where I live. So this episode two, the the first of these topical clusters, is devoted to looking at the history of empire, particularly European empires, and encounters stemming largely from the 16th century, the expansion of Europe beyond the boundaries of the Eastern Atlantic and the Mediterranean. And so, to get started, how Europe's colonial encounters have shaped the world in which we live today. Something major happened in Europe in the 16th century. Looking back from where we are now, it must have been an interesting but also quite disturbing time to be alive. For centuries, the focus of much of the continent had been on itself, and so when the people of continental Europe looked outside of those boundaries, it was to the immediate south, to Muslim Spain and North Africa, or to the east, to the Turks and the Arabs, to the Holy Land, and to a certain degree to the Silk Road, to China, Japan, and so on. Then quite suddenly, new worlds emerged, quite literally. By this, I don't just mean Christopher Columbus, or even just the new trade and empire routes the Portuguese developed around Africa into the Indian Ocean. These were phenomenal in themselves. But those discoveries and the European exploitation of what they found were to transform the continent of Europe in ways that have shaped so much of what we now take for granted. This was, of course, also the time of the Reformations, the massive social and political revolutions that displaced the old order in many parts of Europe. Even to this day, I think we're still trying to understand how or why the Reformations happened, and indeed what these events were about. It was a time of a substantial change due to the development of the printing press, of diseases, major diseases such as the plague. It was a time when Europe transformed itself, both from without and within. And of course, added to all this, Europe, that is, Christian Europe, the Christian groups, the Christian nations of Europe, were significantly under attack across the eastern edge of the continent. The Turks had finally taken the ancient city of Constantinople and were advancing steadily through large parts of eastern Europe. At the time, there was no way to know whether this advance would be stopped. Vienna was under siege, and indeed the Mediterranean became a battleground for these wars. So let's begin with some basics of this, of the European encounter with others beyond Europe. As the old poem goes, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Of course, this was big. It was very big. Not so much due to what Columbus did with the place that he found, but rather how Europe itself was transformed by what came from and what lay within that massive continent that had been largely unknown to the Europeans before that date of 1492. Firstly, there was the wealth that was plundered, particularly gold and silver. Secondly, there was the vast continent itself of land that the Europeans in their various ways laid claim to. And thirdly, there was the people who lived there already. Now, the wealth shook up relations between parts of Europe in a substantial way. And so, first, of course, Spain profited, and then, through other means, countries such as Holland and England, and then later Britain, eventually became superpowers, not only in Europe, but across the globe. But, 
If we're going to talk about Columbus, we need to determine a number of key things. As every historian knows, he was not the only person who thought the world was round at that time. Everybody thought that. If they didn't, then most ship navigation would have been impossible, since it relied on taking positions from moving across the surface of the globe. Now this is worth mentioning, because it is amazing how much a 19th century legend or myth of the flat earth that Columbus challenged became accepted knowledge across Europe and the English-speaking world. Where Columbus differed from others was that he thought the globe was smaller than the classical thinkers had calculated, and on this matter he was actually wrong. His motivation for travelling was not to find a new continent, of course. It's doubtful that he even discovered or realised the vast extent of the continental landmass of the New World that he bumped into, or he nearly bumped into. He had calculated there would be islands, and that was what he found. But these, he thought, would be a staging post to his voyage further to Japan and Asia, which of course he never managed to achieve. Because of his mistake about the circumference of the world, he therefore calculated that the distance going westward from Europe, of course from Spain, towards the east of Asia was far less than it actually was. If the Caribbean islands, or the coast of America, the West Indies as he named them, had not been there, then there was no way his ships could have survived travelling the immense distance beyond that to Asia. The Pacific is just too wide an ocean to cross as a final leg of an already very long journey. The western trade route from Europe to Asia was just too arduous to make it practical. It was lucky for Columbus and his Spanish sponsors that they found enough in America and its islands to give them more than what they had actually desired. But it took a number of years for them to find this. In an almost parallel history to this, are, of course, the events related to the Portuguese explorations to the east, particularly Vasco da Gama, who was as important as Columbus in many ways. In particular, da Gama's development of the sea route around the south of Africa and then northwards up and across the Indian Ocean, which he did for the first time in 1498. It's worth noting that both Columbus and da Gama sought a main end point and this was to find a route to the Spice Islands of Southeast Asia, and they hoped in doing so also to make contact with the lost Christian emperor of Prester John. Both of these related to the problem of Europe, or more correctly the problem of Christian Europe, that is, what to do with Islam and the Muslim powers to their east and their south. Spain and Portugal had a recent history of fighting the crusade of reconquest in the Iberian Peninsula. This had driven the Moors, that is the Muslims, out of that part of Europe, or expanded Europe to the south to the tip of the Mediterranean Sea. But Muslims still dominated the eastern and southern Mediterranean. The Turks were in the east, having conquered Constantinople and ending the Eastern Roman Empire. They had established their rule in large parts of Eastern Europe, particularly the Balkans and what is now Romania, Hungary and Bulgaria. The power of these Turks meant that their armies threatened to destabilise the heart of Europe with the siege of Vienna in 1529 and the threat of this continuing for the next century. And the dominance of Arabs in the southeastern areas, the Levant and Egypt in particular, meant that trade routes to the east, from where the spices came, were dominated by Arab and Turkic traders. Most spices came either from India or islands in what is now Indonesia, the Moluccas. The huge demand for spice in Europe, despite its high price, meant that trade flourished with the Muslim countries and merchants, in the markets of Alexandria and northern Egypt, which received these goods from Arab traders crossing the Indian Ocean with the trade winds, and then sailing up the Red Sea or making the journey overland on its coast. Or otherwise, the spices were sailed from the Indian Ocean up the Persian or Arabian Gulf and across the deserts of Iraq by caravan. Those in the end point of this trade route, the Arab and Turkic traders, were able to set a very high price for European buyers. They literally had the market cornered. On top of this, the powers that traded with these traders in the eastern Mediterranean also became rich and powerful. This accounted for the rise of Venice in particular, as a maritime nation that eventually controlled much of the Christian Mediterranean maritime interests. They came into conflict with the Ottomans and the Arabs, 
but they were also the hub of trade between the Muslim and the Christian worlds. This was why the Spanish and the Portuguese sought so desperately to find another way of doing this, or getting their own stake in the spice trade, by cutting out both the Venetian Christian and the Arab Muslim middlemen. Columbus's findings didn't achieve this end, although he did pave the way for Magellan's circumnavigation, crossing both the Atlantic and the Pacific, and the Spanish claim for the Philippines. In contrast, the Portuguese explorations around the tip of Africa and into the Indian Ocean led to them eventually taking almost complete control of the spice trade. Ironically, they were so successful at this that they managed to meet the high demand for spices in Europe, and thus the value of this commodity plummeted. Portugal became very rich and established a wide network of influence in South and Eastern Asia, but they eventually made the exotic spices of the East a commonplace, devalued commodity. Neither the Spanish or the Portuguese managed to find Prester John. Instead, they established new Christian colonies in the worlds that they conquered. Prior to this, for nearly five centuries, crusading was part of Europe, shaping European countries and cultures, determining Europe's relations beyond its borders. In many respects, colonialism was merely an extension of this. Columbus's voyage to Japan and da Gama's to India were both crusades in their own right, made on behalf of the ultimately successful crusading countries of Spain and Portugal, who had in fact crusaded their way back to nationhood by driving out the Moors from the Iberian Peninsula. These all connect, but not in the same way. The crusades continued but took new forms. The Spanish found the new world, and thus found a new challenge for Christianity to convert the natives to the true faith, the Portuguese took over the eastern spice trade and in doing so also discovered Brazil in South America, but were unable to take their ultimate prize of Jerusalem, which lay much closer to home. And in the midst of all this, the apparently unified Christian society of Western Europe tore itself apart with the Reformation, and in particular the nations that decided to leave the fold of Catholic Christendom then became major players of international power. This leads to the question of how it was that other countries to the north of Spain and Portugal became involved in this project of international colonisation and imperialism, in particularly the French, who of course remained Catholic, but also the Protestants of Holland and England and later Britain. During the 16th century, the French were a very significant and powerful empire in Western Europe, but they lost power and became overshadowed by Spain after the latter put to use the riches it took from the New World. The Dutch themselves rose to prominence through their assertion of independence from Spain. Likewise, the English were motivated by their relationship with Spain. At first, in the 16th century, they were an ally to Spain. Henry VIII's first wife, was of course Catherine of Aragon, and his daughter Mary married King Philip, who was, for a brief time, the husband of the Queen of England. But it set itself at odds with Spain through its choices of a Protestant identity. Henry's divorce, and then, after a decade of instability, Elizabeth's Protestant accession, made England a Protestant rather than a Catholic country. The initial policy of alliance between England and Spain deteriorated, eventually leading to the infamy of the failed Spanish Armada, the attempt by Spain to subjugate the English into submission and re-entry to the Catholic fold. The American colonies and their riches were initially used by the English as an excuse to challenge Spain, as shown by the actions of both Francis Drake and Walter Raleigh. That is, Drake's attacks against the Spanish in the Caribbean and Florida in 1585 and 86, and Raleigh's written policy of settlement in America as a means, he argued, for countering Spanish power, and attacking, of course, their vessels. That is, the first colonies were not only to lay claim to the virgin lands of the northern American continent, they were also to be bases for organising piracy against Spanish treasure ships. Most of the American colony ventures were funded initially by the looting of whatever Spanish ships could be attacked in the Caribbean. The eventual settlement in the colonies, however, established more conventional forms of trade. From the 1610s onwards, this was in particular tobacco, 
but also later crops were transplanted to the New World that brought in even further riches, such as sugar, rice and eventually cotton. And of course this trade was highly organised, and had commodities going the other way, from east to west. This included not only supplies for the colonists from their European bases, but also the trade in labour, that is, slavery from Africa. The British involvement in this trade began even before any colonies were established. The first English colony was in North Carolina at Roanoke in 1586, but the English trader Jack Hawkins took a ship of 300 Africans to the Caribbean in 1562 for sale as slaves. And in the midst of all this, there were the encounters with people in these new lands. The Portuguese in Africa, Brazil, Southern America, South and Southeast Asia, and then in China, particularly Macau, followed by the Dutch in Southern Africa, Southeast Asia, and also North and Central America. Of course, the Dutch famously founded the city of New Amsterdam, which was later exchanged with the British for territories in Suriname in Central America and Southeast Asia. The Caribbean, Central America and South America, and also the Philippines for the Spanish. And then the British, Dutch and French in Northern America and the Spanish in Florida. All of these brought these European powers into contact with new people, raised big questions for the Europeans of how to understand them, how to grasp their cultures, their lifestyles, the military threat that these populations posed, the potential for conversion, but also their potential in other ways, for example, as a labour force, as potential slaves. All of these repercussions worked through Europe on an intellectual, a military, an economic, and in some cases an anthropological level, for centuries to come, in ways that are still being explored. What was the right for the Europeans? How did they see their right to take the land from these native people, particularly in America? Did this come from an underlying superiority of the Europeans as a race, as a people, as a culture, or as a civilization? Or was it a God-given right? And for whom and by whom was that right given? Alongside all of this, there were continual relations with people of the Muslim lands, the Muslim powers to the east and the south, the Ottoman Turks, the Seljuk Arabs, Barbary Corsas, Indian Rajputs, Southeast Asian spice growers, and the various kingdoms in the wider islands of Indonesia and the Malay Peninsula. All of these were in the process of development through these centuries, through this history of encounters between the various European groups and nations from the 16th century onwards right down to the present day. None of these are new things to us. We may perhaps feel that we have only discovered our encounter with Islam in the West since 9-11, since 2001, or maybe a few decades before that. This is, these have been ongoing debates for many centuries. European history and culture has been made by these encounters. The boundaries of Europe and its shape and sense of itself have grown up from distinguishing Europeans, ourselves, itself, from others, whoever those others may be, Muslims, Indians, natives, and so on. The history of Europe is a history of engaging with encounters. This has largely happened through conquest, leading to exploitation, and very often colonisation. But we should also give some thought at some point to what happened the other way round, how the people and the encounters outside of Europe have changed through them doing so, how the people, the many people who are not Europeans, have themselves changed through those encounters with Europeans, how those encounters and those people through their changes have in themselves formed the Europe that we know. Well, thanks for listening today. I'll be continuing these introductions to the uh, topics and clusters of the Histories Inc. podcast series. In the next episode, I'll be talking about religion and particularly the uh, issues of the Reformation, of Protestant Reformation in Europe and beyond, and also the more specific issues of the encounter, the historical encounter between European people and Islam. <laughs>
So if you want to find out more about me and about this podcast series and other podcasts that I also run, including one specific to my, my general academic interests, Mallory and I, Writer and Academic, or more specifically, an introduction to topics in the study of religion and culture, which I've called Religion Bites. You can find them on malloryandi.com forward slash podcasts. Okay, well, I'll see you in the next episode. Bye for now.